All right, everybody, good morning. Thank you very much for making it out today for our course on stage and theater lighting for schools. This is going to be very much a survey level course and overview. The idea being that we'll provide a uh, general engineering architectural look at what goes into the construction of a modern school lighting system. We'll touch upon some, uh, let's say, miscellaneous, or you know, it's coming from our perspective as lighting experts, let's say uh, accessory, auxiliary, parallel, complementary systems as well as we go in. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar at all, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Please use the Q&A module that's built into Zoom uh, we ask that you do not use the chat because the Q&A, we're able to store the questions. That way, if uh, we feel like we can give better information at a later time um, or we want to dive into a little more depth, we have that and we can follow up. Also, it stays a little bit nicer than the chat, which can move pretty quickly. So again, the Q&A module built into your toolbar. A couple other little pieces of uh, PSAs before we begin. For those of you who are attending this uh, session for the AIA credit, uh, we will send a short survey at the end of the course, very quick, about four or five questions, where you will be able to enter your AIA number. And as soon as we receive that response, we'll enter it into the system, getting you your credits. Uh, this is a 1LU credit course. We do have some courses that offer the HSW credit as well. Uh, in that survey, you'll be able to have an opportunity to um, ask about some of those sessions as well. Uh, all right, so let's start to dive in. We will be joined a little bit later by Mike as well. Uh, I was able to rope him in, rope him in at the last second. He is a uh, data trove of uh, information on this topic, so you'll see his face pop up a little bit later as well. So this is Stage and Theater Lighting for Schools. And my name is Dan Litvin. I am a co-founder and president here. And uh, a lot of my responsibilities are as the ghost in the machine, uh, helping things run smoothly from the back end. But in addition to that, uh, I do have an emphasis on control systems as well as um, uh, doing the educational outreach and, and educational endeavors that our company uh, offers. My background is in electrical and computer engineering, graduated here in New Jersey from Rutgers University. I know we have uh, a lot of attendees here from uh, the great state of New Jersey. I am a professional member of the USITT, which we'll talk about a little bit later if you're not familiar with the USITT. Uh, it is a wonderful resource for educational materials for yourself and also for the uh, people whom you are building theaters for. And also a published author uh, as well. I have an article coming out in a uh, future edition of LD&A magazine, a leading magazine in the LED lighting world. As a company, Pure Stage is a subsidiary of Pure Lighting Company. We are members of the USIDT, the AIA, thank God, otherwise your time here would be only half as useful, and the IAS, the Eliminating, Eliminating Engineering Society. And we work primarily in schools. As you see, we have uh, co-op memberships, uh, but we do love working with architects as well. It helps us elevate our game. It allows us to tackle challenges and work with like-minded uh, individuals, companies, firms, and groups uh, to tackle such issues, such problems, and such projects as well. So I'm going to get started here. Uh, excuse ahead of time the salesiness of this next video. It is a video which we play uh, during our actual sales meetings. The reason that you're seeing it is that it provides a really good overview of different components, technologies, integrations, and uh, let's say a sense of the amazement that a school theater can provide. So uh, we're not trying to sell you any products, but the video uh, does some justice that way. So 
here we go. So, excuse me. So as a company, we've been working with schools for a long time. Uh, in the past three years, we've designed over 50 uh, school theater projects, ranging from just the lighting to working with partners on uh, all sorts of technology systems. And as you see, when we talk about lighting, we have different emphases. We have the house lighting, which can be RGBW, can be just standard lighting. We'll talk more about that. Aisle lighting, important for egress, especially in terms of fire code safety. We have, of course, the stage lighting system, which is the first thing that I think most of us think about. Uh, rigging is going to be an integral element of any system because we need to be able to hang our lights as well as our set pieces and some other components. Now we'll talk about audiovisual integrations from the visual component, such as projection, video walls, to the sound component, as well as some control systems. This is something that we can do in a modern system in terms of the integration component and the integration element. Again, we'll talk more about that in a few moments. Right. In terms of uh, theaters, we do want to be able to provide a comprehensive service. And this is something that we do provide from the engineering design. We'll talk a lot about that today, uh, project management. And then, of course, uh, the last component here, and that's going to be the startup and post project. That's something else I want to talk about because I think it's something that goes under the radar a lot when we're talking about these types of projects. You're going to see here all the different types of uh, players that work in this type of field. Again, we'll dive into this as well as we go, as well as some of the benefits of incorporating upgrades to a theater and auditorium system for schools, including the theater rental um, budgetary benefits that come from that. All right, so that's it for anything that's remotely salesy. I appreciate you guys sticking in with that there. We're not going to watch that video again. All right. So now let's get into here talking about uh, the benefits of a theater upgrade. Why are we trying to benefit or why are we trying to upgrade our theater in the beginning? Why is this important for us? So for schools, there's going to be a lot of reasons why this is a a place that we should put some emphasis on. So first off, we have hands-on STEAM learning opportunities. There is a huge movement in terms of pushing for STEAM learning. That is going to be science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. This is something that started as early as uh, President Obama's uh, tenure, and it's been consecutively pushed since then to get our educational uh, outcomes as a nation to that top tier level where, uh, quite frankly, I think they should be um, and can be. In addition to that, we have co collegiate and professional experience for students. The systems that we put into schools are going to be the same exact systems that are used in a professional level, just a little bit smaller. It allows a graceful step from the high school level to the collegiate level, and actually even steps back before that from the middle school level to the high school level. That's going to be important as well because we want students to be able to engage. We don't want this to be something that's far off and unused. Far too often, the systems that we see installed after about six months are barely being used, maybe used at about 25% capacity. And we're not talking about the uh, limited audience due to COVID. We're talking about limited usage due to uh, the inability of staff members to use it and a little bit of a lack of creativity and difficulty of Use, problems that need to be solved in a modern school system. Going forward from that, we have developmental benefits from theater programs. We'll talk about that. Additional source of income from rentals. Uh, we've been talking to a few school boards here in New Jersey, and in New Jersey, school boards are limited to a township, and school boards that actively rent their theaters can expect to make up to about a million dollars extra from rental revenue a year. That is going to pay off that theater upgrade rapidly. That's going to provide more money for the school. And as we know, uh, schools oftentimes are uh, receiving a little bit less than they would like to be able to receive. And also schools can generate their own money. Then ultimately, ideally, that's a little bit less burden on the taxpayer. 
uh, for you know going forward utilization for community events and improvements for school districts and townships. Um, as architects, there is a lot of fun to be had in the theater in the auditorium. It is a piece de, de resistance right there. It is a uh, opus for a school, uh, you know, a place that is uh, quite magnificent. And that helps uh, in terms of communities, that helps in terms of the schools, that helps attract new people to that district. In terms of STEAM learning opportunities, again, we want hands-on opportunities for the kids. I don't know about you guys, but I was very much a hands-on learner in school. And the theater allows so many STEAM learning opportunities from uh, physics, where you have interactions and forces, stuff that you guys are very familiar with, energy and work, electrical forces, optics, and more. You have programming and coding for this, um, for the uh, boards, for the sound, and for the lighting. You have electric circuits. You have fine digital art uh, components going in here, media production, public speaking, business and marketing classes. You have the whole foray inside of this theater space. And in terms of educational outcomes, this is something that really does benefit students in a dramatic way. Theater programs, well-developed theater programs have shown to increase test scores, have increased attendance, lower dropout rates, uh, improved performance from students with learning disabilities, and have been shown to increase self-confidence, self-esteem, communication skills, teamwork, interpersonal skills, and creativity. This is something that is going to benefit students and an old outdated system or no system at all is going to be a barrier for students to be able to participate. So from here, you know, hopefully you're all uh, stoked on why this is necessary. So before we dive into the depths of the technology, I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, Mike. Uh, Mike is uh, the co-founder here. He is the COO and he is the person responsible for making the theaters shine. Uh, his expertise is in theater lighting design and distribution systems, and he is coy uh, on that as well because he is quite first in uh, the whole rigmarole when it comes to theaters. His background is an electrical and electronics engineer from Syracuse University, a professional member of the Illuminating Engineering Society, and also a published author. Um, I'll talk to you at the end of this webinar, but at this point, I am happy to turn it over to Mike. Hello, um, Dan, just give me a thumbs up. You could hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, um, you probably see that in my car and uh, we'll start this off light. Try not to book two speaking engagements in one day back to back. <laughs> but I am all ready to go and I'm looking forward to this. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with a uh, video here. Perfect. And what we're looking at right here uh, is a gonna be a before and after a new construction of a modern uh, high school auditorium technology upgrade. Uh, this is gonna get us into the mood and we're gonna discuss all these features. Again, picture, uh, videos worth thousands of words. Uh, you could see some before and afters. Uh, there's new lighting, new house lighting, audio visual projection, new seating, paint, a roll top desk right there. Uh, now we're gonna look at the rigging system. Um, everything really comes together finally for a um, full scale high school upgrade uh, to put this technology into our students' hands. And that's a wonderful stage, full color wash. Uh, you can see obviously the projection screen coming down. Uh, some pictures during construction. <laughs> Uh, so many hours done and I uh, dealt with project management. Uh, so curtains, uh, traveler curtains, um, uh, the main valance, uh, they have a rigging system uh, with hoists, uh, nylon rope, that's all new, ETCP certified, and there we have an operator working on a stage lighting console and then the video pans over to the audio console right next to each other. So ideally you could have two operators working side by side. 
uh, the control booth position. Now you're seeing some uh, different stage lighting positions up in the uh, ceiling. Uh, aisle lighting to illuminate during a performance for emergency egress. That's a nice uh, little shot showing some of the technology, showing the speakers, showing side box boom positions. And really a lot of work, uh, a lot of different um, construction trades, professionals, architects, engineers, uh, lighting designers, lighting dealers, uh, technology uh, dealers, all coming together uh, to make this a reality. All right, Dan, let's uh, move on to the next slide then. Let's, right. So we're going to discuss theater technology systems. And I'm going to jump in uh, after seeing that video. What different, differentiates a, a theatrical lighting system? And the first thing we're going to jump into, we're going to discuss uh, DMX protocol. DMX is uh, the language. Uh, it's a short for digital multiplex. Um, created way back in 1986. Actually, it, they were looking at it as a potential uh, language early Microsoft days. Um, and so it has 512 channels. And these channels correlate, you can see now on the screen, to different functions on stage lights, on, uh, we'll see in a little bit, on rigging, on the controls. And you can utilize up to 512 channels on numerous fixtures to send them different signals. Um, in association with DMX, we have something called RDM. RDM was a technology that allowed bi-directional um, communication for these fixtures. So now not only are you sending information to the stage lighting fixtures, you're getting feedback from the stage lighting fixtures uh, to let you know, um, first of all, cognitive feedback uh, to ensure that they're doing what they're supposed to. Also, it's very important in terms of addressing and we'll see some of the uh, rendering possibility. Artnet, and uh, CACN data distribution uh, is allows the data signal to be uh, sent over an Ethernet network, which is very important when it comes to uh, uh, to cost um, and flexibility in designing these technology systems. Uh, next slide. All right. So, what are we looking for on stage with a uh, stage lighting upgrade? So first on the top picture, you're seeing a uniform uh, RGBW. Uh, so it's red, green, blue, white uh, stage color wash. And so uh, as with a proper lighting plan, we would like to ensure that there is uniformity in stage lighting across the entire stage. Also, you're seeing that red curtain uh, across the back uh, wall, which we'll talk in a little bit about. Next, something called three point lighting, very similar to uh, studio lighting, uh, as used in TVs and film, if you project light from three different directions, um, from behind, overhead, and in front, you are able to reduce the shadow directly beneath the user, and also you're able to illuminate more of the face and eliminate shadowing um, from overhead. So we will look in our basic conceptual designs to incorporate both a stage color wash as well as three-point lighting. Now, let's move on now to specialty stage lighting. And just a couple of pictures, um, additional effects that lighting can portray. First uh, image up top, uh, those giraffes are from the iconic Lion King scene uh, from on Broadway. And that what they did is they took a back curtain, uh, they put uh, all sorts of different uh, costumes and props in front, and they made the back uh, screen and back curtain um, washed in color to resemble a sunset and sunrise throughout the performance. On the next picture below it, that's a typical uh, modern or contemporary dance performance. And you can see side lighting. Side lighting is so important to give definition and uh, perception um, on the stage uh, to illuminate the dancer as well. Um, we'll talk about soft hard spot lighting in the upcoming slide, as well as automated movers. And now you can see on this slide, uh, some different types of fixtures, how they look. I'm gonna jump through a little bit. First, I wanna throw out some of the brand names and trade names on these products. We have uh, LED or non-LED ellipsoidals. We have a follow spot. We have a moving wash light, par LED light, 
and a uh, Fresnel with uh, barn doors. Uh, every single light has a different purpose, as to be imagined. Uh, the lights with the longer chambers create more of a spotlight effect. Uh, so they're from farther throw to uh, highlight specific features. Uh, lights with a wider distribution are going to uh, give you that stage wash that we looked at. And then uh, lights with uh, barn doors or framing shutters are going to allow you to angle different beams of light to obtain the effect that you're looking for. Uh, those barn, do barn doors really come in handy when they might be working on a particular side of the stage and want to uh, cover that area of light. And of course, when you get to specials, you have LED moving wash, moving spot, uh, beam, uh, hybrids, and they give you all the effects. And I'm sure we've seen concerts uh, where all these lights are moving around. And that's uh, to, uh, an example of such a product. All right, let's move on now to spotlighting. So we talked about spotlighting. I want to give a couple of examples. And most of these photos are used from uh, project designs, which uh, we have um, uh, worked on. And so we see different positions to get you that perspective. So on the first picture, we have spotlights, something called front of the house, where they're on that um, uh, rigging structure above. And then to the side, it's called the box boom or side lighting position. And there's different types of mounting for them um, to give effect and of course, different amounts of uh, spotlights. Um, uh, one important thing to note is that the beam angle is going to have to match with the distance away uh, on stage that it is. Let's move on then to the next slide. Right, and if we're gonna jump into the specifications on some of these products, uh, we wanna understand what it is we're looking at. So stage lights, unlike LED lights, they are a little bit of a different animal. Um, they have more uh, details and they have different specs that we have to um, focus on. So first and foremost, we're seeing uh, the position of it. And uh, again, to the left, there's different beam angles. Well, this particular product has an adjustable beam angle. So we're seeing at 40 degrees, uh, there's one lumen output. And then at 10 degrees, uh, that lumen output increases. As to be expected, as you uh, decrease the beam spread of a fixture, the light output is going to uh, increase in a, uh, according to the ratio. Um, on the bottom, you're seeing different amplitudes and you're seeing frequencies. One thing that's interesting is blue is uh, gonna come in at, at a higher amplitude, which correlates to our eyes in intensity seen at, as a brighter color. So when you're seeing terms such as color correction, that means certain light manufacturers are increasing the output of the red to match the blue, which the blue is naturally gonna be brighter if you're just putting the same amount of LED chips into the fixture. Um, another interesting note, although traditional dimming systems based on halogen and incandescent lights uh, were always working on 110 to 120, uh, LEDs can now operate at 100 um, to 277 um, AC current voltage. Uh, we talked a little bit about DMX, the cables that can uh, transfer DMX and RDM will vary between a five pin or a three pin DMX wire to RJ45, uh, which is quickly becoming the standard due to conformity and low cost. Moving further on the specifications, we're seeing a whole lot of uh, data and detail about this specific product um, that we're looking at. One thing to notice is I mentioned before RGBW. We, we know that uh, RGB stands for red, green, blue, any combination of the three colors is going to cover pretty much the spectrum. We, certain manufacturers also add in white uh, to get you um, a nice uh, white that is not a mix of RGB, which doesn't translate very well on stage or on TV screen. Others will uh, substantiate and add on other LED chips such as cyan, amber, uh, in or for and lime. Uh, for different effects. Lime, for example, a greenish hue to the white turned, uh, looks much better on a uh, um, TV, uh, whereas amber gets you uh, more of that traditional theatrical warm white look. <laughs> if you're under 
an LED light with a uh, strong amber. It almost feels, you almost feel the heat coming off of it, although obviously they're much more energy efficient. Also UV, and this is not disinfection UV, this is just regular UV, uh, is a nice effect that certain lights have uh, that um, can show uh, phosphorus paint, paint that without the UV wouldn't be visible for a quick little uh, backdrop change uh, or markings on stage. Uh, LEDs, when it mentions number of LEDs, uh, it's referring to two different uh, outputs. There's certain stage lights that have a pixelated output and you see multiple different LEDs. The others that have a modular where they just take the LEDs on a board, put a reflector and make it seem like the light output is coming from uh, a traditional light source. Uh, the second is very popular because lighting designers are very picky in that they want their LED lights to almost look identical to their traditional halogens. Other features are color calibration. Uh, it's adjusting RGB values, different RGB values for different fixtures. Uh, so different blues might not match. So it's important to be able to either automatically or manually be able to uh, color calibrate these fixtures. Same thing with color temperature. Uh, mentioned uh, fixtures that have the white LED chip usually can be adjusted anywhere from 2000 Kelvin all the way up to 8000 Kelvin, uh, which is again important in stage lighting if you want to uh, reflect a daylight scene that would be closer to 5,000 Kelvin or a sunset, which would be uh, 2,500. Uh, the ability to adjust fan speed. Uh, we've worked on designs where we want to ensure that the stage is completely quiet. So being able to reduce the light output to make sure that the fan cannot be heard within the fixture is a nice feature to have. And then of course there's a P pulse width mod modulation or PWM uh, frequency. And uh, our, although our eyes might see stable colors at particular frequencies, cameras require much higher frequency in order not to get that shuddering flickering effect that you see sometimes with poorly taken video. So again, that's really the difference between higher end product uh, as opposed to something that you might see on Amazon. The price difference might be significant, but these features, there's a, that's really the difference in cost. Uh, two more points to point out is one, although the LEDs are only 100 watt uh, rated, the power consumption is 220. And that's because there are fans, there are um, LED displays and other electronics built into the unit that add on additional 40 watts. Uh, very important to look at overall power consumption when designing a system rather than just LED output, if we're looking to size circuits and ensure that you're getting um, maximum impacity. And also something else, uh, the IP rating is common with uh, stage lighting manufacturers. This is IP65 rated, means that it can be utilized uh, outdoors for outdoor events. Um, again, these are not for the most part, not permanently installed fixtures. Uh, they're meant to be moved around from pipe to pipe, in certain cases taken outside uh, for an outdoor event. All right, we're gonna move on then to something called a lighting plot. Lighting plot is just that, it's a drawing used by theatrical designers uh, to provide instructions for lighting de um, design installers and crews. Uh, it provides the information such as what type of fixture, um, how it's positioned, uh, the channel patch number to correspond with the lighting console, the DMX address, let's see, lens angle, orientation. You can see they're shifted in different directions. It needs to be specifically matched. And the dimmer and relay, dimmer relay connection number uh, to ensure that uh, the uh, operator has all control over these lights. Um, as mentioned before, it is very common for high schools to completely change the position of their lighting based on the performance, based on the effect they're going for. So such a plan will uh, provide instructions to crews to be able to modify everything. So on a design element, it's crucial that the client has not just DMX and a power connectivity at every single location where lights are um, uh, being uh, placed, but also that they have more than sufficient capacity, uh, assuming that to allow a lighting designer uh, any um, capability to do what they can only imagine. And the next slide, you're gonna see very similar lighting layouts, but now done on computer. So on the right is a uh, visual image of a lighting console. 
uh, in this case, it's ETC, and that's called a magic sheet, showing the same lighting plot just digitally. And this is pretty cool. And this utilized that RDM language I spoke about before, but that two-way communication between stage light and console. So not only uh, are you, is the operator able to put a uh, visual representation of every single light that's on stage onto their screen, but they can, they can simply operate them by just tapping the light fixture and then controlling the dimming, the auto zoom, the color changing. To the left, the image is 3D render. Uh, in order to uh, set up a proper lighting plot for a show, this point, the stage setup, even people are simulated and they're placed on a, similar to an AutoCAD uh, software. And then you can see some, uh, they're called uh, 3D visualizers. And they're available from uh, pretty much all the major console manufacturers, such as Grand MA, uh, each CEO's capture, and they allow a um, positioning in three dimensions, color tuning, color changing, and really just running full shows, uh, then that can be transitioned to a lighting plot and given instruction to be set up for a real show. All right, we're gonna jump into uh, the controls overview. And controls really, five main parts that we mainly see in a high school. There are other components that we will also touch up on, but they consist of a lighting console, which uh, a user operator controls uh, the light fixtures from, controls such as entry stations or touchscreen. Touchscreen is a, just a smaller version of the lighting console, less features, um, but easier to use. Entry stations allows not just on and off uh, lighting ability, but also any presets, for example, walking in and pushing preset four can turn on the reds uh, from one lighting position for a certain spotlight effect. Dimming relay panels, uh, there we'll talk about two different types, whether they are dimmers or relays, uh, different technologies utilize them. Uh, I, th I think of this as the spine of the operation. This is what gives motion and the lighting console is the brain. Uh, processor, uh, now it is common to utilize just typical CU racks, uh, to run all the data and uh, run network uh, cable to all the devices to make for ease of usability. And of course, power data distro, uh, knowing the amount of circuits, the size of the cable, uh, I'm sorry, the gauge, the opacity, um, and ensuring that there's plenty of circuits for the maximum amount of stage lights that the, any designer wants to incorporate. I'm gonna see these uh, components within a one line. Uh, so take note from one of our designs, you can see the dimmer rack uh, and that's on, that's mentioned right in the center, the echo relay panel, and that houses all the power distribution. It connects directly to the left to a uh, control rack, which houses all the data. You're seeing that connections come from the data for the entry stations for to the left, and there are six of them. To the right, all those cables, and that's gonna be CAT 5E or CAT 6, running to different data ports, and that transmits data to different locations, such as over stage, over the seating area, or the house, um, uh, into the back of the house, each single position. And so rule of thumb with all those DMX positions is that one DMX um, gateway can hold 512 addresses, uh, as we learned about DMX before, which is equivalent to about 36, I'm sorry, 32 uh, channels times 36, right? I think, I'm sorry, times 16. Um, I'm sorry, 32 times 36, don't have a calculator in my head. And, and that is a maximum amount of 32 fixtures per each location, assuming there are enough um, channels in the software uh, being provided. So again, uh, scalability from one to 32 for every position is going to give any high school a setup that in the future could resemble something of a professional Broadway uh, production. But it currently, uh, it's just, it's the possibility. Uh, then we're seeing different electrics. Uh, these are the connector strips. Uh, that's where the power distribution is going to be distributed from. That is all interconnected to the dimmer rack. Uh, up top, there's something uh, that's uh, labeled as emergency. Um, 
We will talk about this in a little bit. And that's essentially the emergency connectivity to either the building's generator or uh, UPS um, to uh, turn on for emergency and egress lighting. Seeing connections to the lighting consoles. And at this point, uh, lighting console has sliders and faders and push buttons, and also usually comes with two touch screens so that uh, you're getting that tactile response where the user can change any of the um, magic sheets or color codes and really uh, immerse themselves. Um, kids these days, they want everything on touch screens and our job is to please the kids. We move on to the next screen. And this is just kind of an up close on data distribution. Uh, one key point is typically CAT6, CAT5E runs should not exceed 300 feet. You're seeing something here, which is interesting. Each uh, connection is a home run. That is important because if we start daisy chaining uh, some of these um, runs, well, we could easily exceed a 300 feet uh, um, termination points. And that is uh, a problem because you will start, those DMX signal is going to start fade out and we're going to start losing uh, connectivity. So we, in certain cases, recommend DMX splitters, which allow uh, these home runs to occur and not exceed 300 feet. Uh, uh, certain cases, we use DMX boxes for smaller setups, which will carry, again, up to 512 addresses. And then there's something called DMX um, distribution devices, and different manufacturers have names for like gateways or nodes. And these uh, support numerous universes. So again, you, one universe is 512 addresses and four universes is 512 times four. I'm not gonna try the math thing again <laughs> after last failure. Um, and we're that way able to transport large amounts of, of data to different locations on the auditorium um, based on what, again, the client is looking to do. Moving on to the next slide, we're gonna look at a uh, typical dimming station. And we're seeing here drawings, uh, Again, three dimensionals that talk about whether it's surface or flush mounting, uh, the conduit entrance, phases opacity, uh, number of circuits per station, disconnecting means. These are all considerations um, when we're putting different devices, whether they are data driven, power driven, or a hybrid of both. And then we're going to move on to a, a typical entry station uh, configuration. And you could see here we're taking a CAT 5E connection and uh, utilizing um, it to uh, feed an entry station which uh, stores presets such as lights on off, lights 50%. Something to look out for here, are obviously the type of cable, it's specified on the very top here that it's a Belden 1583A and uh, means of termination. Uh, there are punch down, there's compression, there's RJ45 uh, termination plugs. There's soldering, please don't use soldering. I hate soldering. I'm terrible at it. Um, moving on to the next slide, we're going to look at LED house lighting and emergency egress. Uh, two pictures, we saw the video before of the auditorium, we're seeing afterwards, uh, nice uniformity throughout, uh, brightness, uh, and then on the flip side, that auditorium can dim to a very low percentage and at um, very even uniform dimming scale to provide uh, functionality that is necessary uh, for a house lighting application. How do we go about making that happen? Computer simulation, naturally. This one I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It is a photometric simulation, uh, the picture right here on top. And it, it we're getting foot candle readings based on the position of lights. So one important thing to note that we've seen with school theater design is that school theater, it's not, a typical auditorium. It is a multi-usage space um, that can be utilized for classes, can be utilized for performances, for rentals. And in doing so, we want to ensure that we give uh, our uh, clients all the different possibilities for what they can use. One of the benefits with DMX is we have the ability to control individual light fixtures. Uh, that way, we could also group certain areas together. Uh, the other part, of course, is um, we want to ensure correct lighting levels. So my experience with schools is really try to design for 50 foot candles uh, at a horizontal level of about 2.5 foot work plane, which is right around where a uh, desk uh, would sit. And that is in accordance with uh, IES, uh, Society, obviously, the Lighting Society of Engineers um, recommendations. 
uh, for classroom lighting. And reason being, especially with the COVID pandemic, uh, a lot of schools are taking these auditoriums because they allow the six foot separation and turning them into test centers, into classrooms. And this way, we're not going to prohibit a dim lighting system uh, from their classroom activities. Um, below, you're seeing a picture of a before and after, and both things that I harp on, A, brightness, B, uniformity uh, with a proper design. Um, one other thing to look at is a lot of auditoriums, they are sloped. So right in the orchestra pit in front of the stage, ceiling height might be 25 to 30 feet. By the time we get to the back of the house, because of the slope, um, we could be looking at 10 to 12 feet height right there. So it's very important to select house lighting, not just one type of fixture, but different lumens, outputs, different beam angles, um, in uh, order to ensure that we are getting a um, very uniform uh, light output throughout the house area of the auditorium. I'm gonna look at uh, such a product here um, with the next slide. And this is a typical house lighting fixture. Uh, I like this product because it gives me options to specify. And even looking at the product, I just talked about slope ceilings, you could see how it adjusts to different slope ceilings to provide a downward light um, with the trim that, that is there. We have different lumen outputs. So again, we could have one style of light, but go anywhere from 8,000 lumens to 870 lumens, depending on the height of the room. Um, 90 CRI plus is pretty much a standard. Uh, we want to make sure that there's a high color rendering index, which um, uh, shows off uh, the true character of colors, uh, which is kind of a no brainer. We see very high CRIs in uh, stores uh, to showcase uh, the product that they're trying to sell. And same thing, we want to have a high CRI for an auditorium application. Fortunately, most um, mainstream uh, house lighting fixtures are now at a standard of 90 CRI, or they give that option. Different color temperatures, uh, 3000 Kelvin, 3500 Kelvin are really the most two standard ones. I feel personally that 27 is a little bit too warm white and 4000 Kelvin is a little bit too classroomy. But again, that's really up for um, the uh, client to work out with the client. The one nice thing is, although this fixture doesn't offer it, we're seeing a switch into um, adjustable uh, color temperature tuning, um, not just have give the operator the ability to change the color temperature from a, you know, a low uh, number to a higher one, but also uh, work with different circadian rhythms to automate that throughout the day. Uh, and then of course the dimming options uh, on the bottom. We're seeing everything from a uh, specific manufacturer control um, to uh, Dolly, to DMX, to zero to 10, um, all sorts of functionality. Really, really important to match the dimming driver and the house lights to whatever dimmer uh, rack you are uh, utilizing and ensure that they're compatible with each other. Uh, that will ensure whether you have a smooth dimming curve that gets you down to 0.1% or something that's choppy and dims maybe at a maximum of 10%. Uh, one thing to also discuss is emergency egress lighting. And we're seeing here a quick little um, circuit breakdown of it, uh, of an inverter. And it, it's in conjunction, numerous states have different um, regulations on this, but there's something uh, called UL 924 for automatic load relay. It allows um, emergency lighting to be controlled uh, by normal lighting um, and ensuring that in case of an emergency that all of the lighting within an auditorium from the house to the stage will kick on to full brightness. Uh, with places of um, high concentration, uh, 50 people or more typically, uh, regular emergency lights that are built into fixtures or that are mounted externally are not going to give enough brightness uh, to force a mass evacuation in a short amount of time. So code now for new construction, a lot of states. Um, I know I have different um, uh, contacts here from different states here. So we're just focusing on the UL, not exact state guidance. Uh, but I at least I know where we are in New Jersey, it is a requirement uh, to comply for all new uh, theatrical lighting systems. So just ensure that the new system has uh, capability uh, to uh, 
accept a, a fire alarm or an emergency signal and switch over. Uh, tie in a lot of times uh, to emergency backup or UPS is done um, separately uh, or it could be worked into the design. And another image of a uh, emergency setup, I showed a remote UPS device, and this is a transfer switch specifically made for DMX addresses. And what you're seeing is it accepts on the lower right uh, different panic connections. Um, it switches over the three phases on the dimmers. And then, of course, there's DMX connections, because as we know, if the DMX signal uh, is set to zero, um, even if we turn the power on, that DM, uh, DMX driven light is not going to turn on. So we have to both uh, turn the power, activate the power, and activate the DMX to full if we want these lights to transfer power and fully illuminate in case of an emergency in a quick manner. All right, we're going to jump into um, now, <laughs> there's a lot of technical stuff. Jump into uh, specialty lighting and uh, play a quick little video. Spin lighting on the right is an article with uh, one of our designs where we put in to a technical institute. Um, it's the first uh, incorporation of this product, although I'm sure it's been copied since. And to give that extra effect, you're seeing both aisle lighting as well as um, uh, side lighting that is DMX controlled, color changing. It really, the goal here is to immerse the audience in color and make them feel part of the show. Uh, the next slide that we're looking at is something called follow spot controls. Uh, this is becoming uh, popular uh, in um, concerts. And of course, <laughs> we try to see what's going on uh, in Broadway, um, in production, and give a smaller version uh, for students to start working with. So on the right, that's, uh, that's a rock band and with numerous spotlights that follow those two guitars wherever they go. Uh, it can be done manually, it can be done automatically by setting different presets. And on the left, you're seeing how this happens. Uh, it's uh, combining moving spotlights with cameras and software. And so it gives the user the ability to move the numerous lights to follow the users um, uh, based on their application and remotely. Uh, also, of course, there's aisle lighting. I have RGBW, it could be white, it could be color changing. Uh, again, there's also with color changing, you could do during certain fades and, uh, to create chase scenes. Uh, now, again, <laughs> it's really popular for some of these performances or uh, events for the character to jump off stage and run down the aisle. And this way you can have a following light follow them to get that um, uh, immersion for the audience into the performance. And of course, there's the safety benefits as well for the more traditional look. Uh, and that can be done with LED strips. Uh, typically, I recommend uh, separate control because you don't need DMX control for regular white light, just on a dimmer in the booth. Uh, but of course, if it's RGBW, you could be tied in and then revert back to regular after that scene ends. All right, we're going to talk about rigging here. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit quickly. Uh, the reason I'm talking about rigging, and I'll soon I'll talk about currents because they're important elements of stage lighting. Uh, rigging gives you the supports uh, to uh, not just move around the lights. Uh, but to control different positions and control um, different scenes and events which the lights illuminate. Everything works as part of a combined system. We have something called dead hun rigging, uh, and there's a few images to the right of it, uh, and that means it's hun in place. Then we have something called counterweight systems, uh, which uh, lock in via nylon or via uh, metal rope um, weights that uh, counterbalance uh, whatever is uh, mounted on stage. The important caveat here is these weights have to be adjusted to correspond with the weight on the pipe. So if fixtures being removed or added, um, the users have to be trained on this. Uh, these devices have to be inspected on an annual basis uh, because of the heavy weights that are attached to the rigging positions. And because it is a safety feature, there's motorized automatic rigging as well. Um, Going forward, you can see all the different components here. Although previously it was significantly more expensive, we're seeing a price drop as systems are becoming smaller and easier to use. Same thing, this has to be uh, annually inspected, uh, but this allows for easier uh, usage of these systems uh, without as much training because it's just a matter of um, pushing a button. And uh, as long as the system is properly installed with uh, safety balances and checks, 
then it's uh, almost anybody can operate it. One more additional fun little feature is that uh, we are able to combine automated rigging when it runs on DMX along with LED lights to create something called kinetic lighting. And what you're seeing right here are balls that are going to change colors that are suspended by uh, independent motors and that are all being controlled by a lighting console, giving you this fun, unique effect, which we're seeing now in more production and uh, even walk into um, certain uh, large areas like uh, hotels or malls uh, to create a lighting show, uh, incorporating uh, three, all three dimensions and a wonderful uh, general aesthetic. Watch that for a while. All right, let's jump into Kerns. Kerns are fairly straightforward, but again, since they their role is to um, either hide the stage fixtures or mask certain parts of um, the stage, they are an important part of a uh, stage lighting system. And the different types of curtains that we're going to look at here are um, starting off with the proscenium curtain. It has different names with front or main curtain. Uh, you're seeing here on the right something called Austrian, which is a traditional curtain um, style. You've seen commonly on Broadway, heavier with more uh, um, ornate designs. Uh, masking, leg and border curtains, uh, they hide equipment and gear. Uh, cross stage or travelers are full-size curtains that hide parts of the stage. Uh, usually you don't want to be able to see the rigging pipes here, as you can see in that second image. A scrim uh, uh, is for visual effects uh, that are created by lighting or projection. And that's usually on the very top lip of the stage. And a cyclorama or a psych uh, that can be either projected, uh, lighting, or painted backdrops. Uh, it could be one hung with a um, uh, flying rigging system. It can be dropped and lowered. Numerous backdrops can be uh, utilized. And uh, the effect everybody's seeing what happened with the nutcracker there as they bring in these all these or, ornate decorations using different sites. A uh, little quick point on current flame proofing. So there are a few terms uh, to look at and to notice. Uh, one is um, non-flame retardant, the other is flame retardant. Uh, these two, although they're out there, we do not recommend. Uh, we recommend any new curtain to be either durably flame retardant or inherently flame retardant. Um, from our experience, uh, auditoriums typically don't wash curtains. Uh, their lifespan and they can maintain flame retardancy for ten, typically 10 years. Uh, so uh, it's typically more cost effective for uh, school districts to replace previous curtains with new, especially because they get wear and tear, than to uh, perform heavy duty maintenance. Um, but ensuring that they're either durably or inherently flame retardant will, will make sure that uh, there are no fire risks. Keep it in mind, please, that cleaning is incredibly important. If a thin layer or a thick layer of dust uh, develops on any inherently or durably flame retardant curtain, uh, you're still creating a uh, situation where fire can occur because the dust itself is um, uh, not flame proof. All right, and then Dan, why don't you take over for additional considerations? All right, thanks, Mike. I know we're running low on time. And since this webinar is on lighting systems, I will flash through this. If you are peaked at any point, reach out and we can, uh, you know, we can geek out about this stuff at a later time. But when you talk about theater systems, you know, most often we're thinking about more than just the lights. And so we would be amiss to have a presentation without going into the audio, visual, and integrative components. So audio systems are going to be a crucial part of a modern system, uh, from the sound for presenters to the sound for musicals, concerts, whatever it might be. One major uh, concern that you may have uh, witnessed yourself is going to be an echoing effect in the audio system. So a properly designed audio system is going to be important. And at the bottom right, you see um, sound uh, proofing via some acoustic tiling. 
uh, in that video from PCTI before, you saw lighting effects that were attached to the acoustic tiling. So you can use acoustic tiling as a very integral part of your design element while still making sure that the sound is crisp and clear. Uh, from that, you see different components. We have all sorts of speakers, as well as the audio board, uh, which is just as intricate and involved as the lighting board. But again, that is for a conversation at a future time and date to go into further. Visual systems are going to allow for further integration and further interactivity. Whether there is a projection screen for a assembly for a presentation or a technology that's coming out now and it's become, it's been out for a while, but it's more affordable and doable now which is video wall technology. This is a modular screen that can be adjusted to essentially any size. Uh, benefit of a video wall over a projection is that it's going to A, maintain brightness, and B, it's not going to have a shadowing effect. Though so in projection, there is an interesting component that's called projection mapping. You see that at the bottom left of the TED Talk, and that's projecting onto irregular shapes. This is a technology that can be done with most modern projectors, so long as it has a high enough lumen uh, output and it has uh, sophisticated enough uh, processing, which again, modern projectors are going to be able to do. And this is something that's interesting enough, again, if there's irregular shape. So both are going to have their pros, uh, both are gonna have their cons, uh, but it's something that should be integra integrated into a, uh, a larger scale system. Mike mentioned this before. I know we just looked at some razzle dazzle, and now we're looking at a desk, and that might seem a little bit uh, anticlimactic. But we need a control booth, and the position of the console desk is actually incredibly, incredibly important. The console operators need to be at a place where, a, in terms of sound, they are able to hear what the audience is hearing. And B, in terms of light and live production, they need to be on the floor live seeing what the audience is seeing. Historically, a lot of older theaters had the uh, roll top desk in an isolated chamber in its own room enclosed in the back or on a second level. This is a trend which has been very quickly dying off, putting in a desk on the floor itself in the back in its own little area that's exposed. One thing that you notice about the roll top desk is you'll see that there's little handles on the top there and that is a locking mechanism. If we're putting this system in a school, the components there are very expensive. We do not want some hooligans to go around uh, grabbing stuff uh, or messing around with some of that pricey equipment. So a locking mechanism is going to be highly important to uh, add into this desk. And finally, to make everything work together, this is using modern technology intelligently. Systems used to require highly trained professionals to operate the lighting and a completely different highly trained professional to handle the sound. Now we can start to integrate all the systems, a projection or a video wall system, the visual system, the audio system, of whatever we're adding into the visual, the lighting systems, all into one very easy to use console. Uh, whether it's a touch panel via web-based or even app-based. And some of the major uh, languages, the major, uh, let's say, companies that are able to bring this together are going to include Crustron, QSIS, Extron, AMX. Uh, you've very likely heard some of these names uh, with some of the integrations across facilities. Again, we want to provide the same thing for theaters so we get to that point where people are using the theater. Guests can use the theater. Uh, low trade uh, staff can use the theater and students can use the theater as well as being able to change scenes and do things on the fly and quickly. In addition to that, there's two more elements here which are oftentimes underserved, especially when specifying a new or upgraded theater. And that's going to be training, training for staff. And as we talk about in a moment, training for students. We recommend adding training and also maintenance as a three to five year plan cooked into the specifications. Training is going to be a refresher course. It's going to be 
and onboarding a deep dive. So again, you have staff members that can utilize the system and an opportunity for new staff members to be able to be onboarded or after a long summer, uh, you know, when you're on vacation and touring the world and hanging with the kids um, to refresh and get you back up to speed with the system as well as new patches, updates, uh, maintenance, et cetera. Maintenance is going to be important for the components of the system, but also uh, legally required uh, for most states in terms of the rigging and fireproofing of the curtains. So incorporating that right in the beginning is going to be a way to ensure safety. Uh, and honestly, I think it is a good, let's say, ethical thing to do for us uh, to make sure the school is uh, keeping up that high level of safety and professionalism for its students. Speaking of students, uh, student training. I mentioned the USITT at the beginning of the course. That's the United States Institute for Theater Technology. This is an organization that is very large at the collegiate and young professional level. And this is an organization that is an advocacy group, a networking group, and most importantly, an educational group for utilizing theater technology. There are courses available for high school level students to learn about the systems, whether it's going to be the rigging system, the lighting system, the audio system, and even to a degree, the integrative systems together. That's a way that ultimately the students themselves can become the shepherds of the theater and utilize the theater for the greatest educational outcome, as well as ensuring that they're safe, as well as anyone who's utilizing the theater is safe as well. So that said, I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, we'll, Mike and I will hang on for as long as there's any questions. Again, we will send as soon as we're done a quick survey. Uh, on that survey, if you want the AIA credit, please open it up and uh, enter your AIA number there. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be happy to, again, stay on for questions and answer. We have the Q&A module built in, so add any questions there. Um, and feel free to reach out at any time with any questions about uh, stage and theater systems. All right, everyone, thank you again. Let's go do this. Perfect. All right, so I have one question right here. Um, and that's, it's a little bit lengthy. I'm going to just go and a paraphrase if you don't mind it. Essentially it boils down to uh, when, when is a, uh, a good sign, good indication for a theater upgrade? When do, uh, you know, what are the indications that we can see that, that, we, that we would say Hey, let's uh, upgrade this theater. The technology is uh, is outdated. Mike, I think that's a good one for you there. The first and foremost uh, would be any of the essential systems, uh, whether it's rigging or dimming, are either at a point of disrepair or obsolete. Um, then, whenever we get to the cost that maintenance and repairs are uh, similar or close to um, upgrade, that is our first consideration. And that is something that can be determined with a inspection and just make sure that whichever uh, inspection service that you're using, they are AETCP certified for rigging, which is the uh, governing authority for uh, entertainment uh, systems. Um, and they are able to put out a written report. Um, so that's the first. The second is other considerations, such as perhaps utilizing uh, the space to generate uh, revenue for rentals. Uh, a, right now, we're seeing uh, an increase with uh, clients that we've upgraded. They are seeing rentals uh, and ability to generate a return on investment, uh, ROI, on their uh, purchase. Um, also, uh, if we're working with public schools, grants, loans, financing, are making it easier for schools to dive into costly expenditures uh, into budget pool. Next question here. Uh, what are the main differences between 
a theatrical lighting system for schools and for a performing arts center. Number one is cost. <laughs> Number two is scale. Uh, at least in our designs, what we try to do for schools is provide the minimum amount of basic fixtures, uh, some wash fixtures, some spotlighting fixtures, maybe a couple of um, specialty fixtures like moving lights. Uh, but most importantly, for these, for the school applications, we're giving them interconnections on both power and data that they could add more components as they go further. Um, cost is a driving factor. Most schools simply do not have the budget that performing arts centers have um, or the need or the ability to drive and rent. Uh, on the flip side, if there are schools that are looking to mirror performing arts center, we could of course subscribe to that model and give them a more robust system. And one thing I'll chime in on that is uh, there are many schools that will be building, especially high schools uh, and larger townships that are actually building full out performing arts centers in their schools and treating their facilities uh, very much as a performing arts center. All right. Next question, a uh, technical one here is uh, for LED lighting upgrades, does the controls infrastructure need to change? It depends. Uh, in most cases, yes. Uh, we're converting from either uh, dimming halogen incandescent lighting. In that case, there are dimmer um, uh, dimming modules that will no longer work with LEDs. If a dimming module is connected to almost any LED light, almost any, there's some that are an exemption, uh, it, you run a high risk of uh, destroying the driver and making the unit obsolete and non-warranty. So uh, in most cases, the answer is yes. Of course, an inspection um, is highly required and a detailed breakdown on uh, the state of their current system uh, and what it would take to upgrade it to LED performance. All right, and those are the questions that I have for, well, it's now this afternoon. Uh, if there are any other questions at any point, again, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, thank you all for attending. Uh, you will receive an email from us in an hour or two and uh, looking forward to future communications and hopefully attend a future webinar with us. All right, everyone have a wonderful rest of your day.